you will see on the team sheet of a Premier League or a La Liga team very soon. Big Sam's 33-1 to 1 for the Cardiff job. That would sort them out, wouldn't it? I mean, this is a man who is quite clearly too good for the division. Hello, guys, and welcome to the Sportsman Untitled. This week, we're going to look ahead to two massive fixtures in the championship and also look at Norwich City Portsmouth and maybe the next Cardiff manager as well. I've got two very special guests with me this week. I'm joined by Jack Reeve from Talk Norwich City. Jack, how are you getting on? Yeah, really good. Thank you. It's a a pleasure to be back on and I'm really excited to speak to you guys. I'm I'm surprised you've got me back on again because I think the last time we spoke was ahead of Norwich's 4-0 defeat to Leeds United at at Ellen Road in the playoffs last season. And uh, yeah, I've kind of been hiding away since that moment. So well done for getting me out of my shell and uh, and teeing me up once more. It's a real pleasure. A bit brighter at Carrow Road at the moment, but we'll come on to that later. And Gab, our regular pundit, is back. Gab, how are you getting on? <laughs> Very well, thanks, Simon. Uh, looking forward to getting stuck into it. Yeah, let's get stuck into it because it's international break, but we've got a couple of big games to look forward to this week. Uh, starting with Leeds versus Sheffield United. I mean, this one on Friday night, absolute belter of a game. Let's start with Sheffield United, Gab. Remain unbeaten. Um, did you see this start of the season coming for, for Wilder's men? Well, given that Sheffield United were in my bottom half before the season, uh, <laughs> probably not. And I think you've got to give real credit to Chris Wilder because um, they're coming into this season off the back of conceding uh, over 100 goals in the Premier League last season. Um, it was talked about as a massive rebuild. Um, but it felt, for, you know, sort of speaking to Sheffield United fans, that there was a willingness to get behind Chris Wilder. And I think his uh, sort of status at the club still... Um, attract, gave him some sort of uh, credibility, if you like, even off the back of the, the problems that he had inherited. And um, actually, a lot of the players that arrived late in the window have settled pretty quickly. Um, they've already got Gus Armour and Calibre Hare linking up nicely. And I think in terms of the best 11, it's looking up there with the, the, the best teams in the division. I think the big question for Sheffield United would be, one, um, they've not played um, the, the top sides yet. So Leeds is going to be a massive acid, to, acid test for them, this trip to Elland Road. And then maybe also the depth in terms of, um, you know, what would happen if certain key players like Gus Harmer, like Callum O'Hare, um, Vinicio Souza, uh, what if they were, were to get injured? So a few question marks still for Sheffield United to address, but definitely better than I expected. And they're looking like a pretty good top six proposition. Jack, for you, kind of a team coming down from the, the Premier League in the former Sheffield United, you know how difficult that is as a Norwich fan, of course. Have you been impressed by, by them so far? Yeah, I have been impressed. And I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a, a, a surprise for me. I, I always think the relegated sides coming down from the Premier League, way too much is is read into the form that we see in, in that previous season. We saw people just assuming that Luton would bounce straight back because they were so close to surviving in the Premier League and that because of Sheffield United's disappointment in the Premier League, everyone assumed that, well, that's their fun over and they'll have to really rebuild in the in the Championship. And that's absolutely no discredit to Chris Wilder. I mean, I've seen both Sheffield United play uh, at Carrow this season and, and Leeds United. I think Leeds are, as you would you know, imagine under a Daniel Farker side, a lot more free-flowing and exciting. But Sheffield United were dogged and tough to, to break down. There's some, some real quality in that side. So... Respect to Sheffield United. And I think, you know, I've had it as a as a Norwich fan before when you're looking at your side in the Premier League and you've almost, you know, not that they'll admit, but they're almost ready to, for the championship season before the Premier League season has finished. And I think we saw that with Sheffield United. So I think with going into any championship campaign, it's always wise to take those form lines of the Premier League with a slight pinch of salt because they can always come back to surprise you. And and much like Gab, I, I fully suspect Sheffield United will be in the top six in this season. Gab, which of these 11s, if we're looking at this Friday night game, you've already spoken a little bit about a few of the key players, but which of the 11, just as the 11, not the squad, do you think has more individual quality? Oh, wow. What a great question. Um, I think it's quite even. Um, I think what you get with Leeds is lots of players who can contribute. Um, I think that they've found it a lot easier to create chances this season than they had than they did last year because um they've got Jaden Bogle um in at right back who's given them a lot more from from that position than an out of position seventeen year old that they had last year. Um 
and um, and Genia Ferpe's kind of come on a level level. And then you've got players like Willie Nonto, who's come on a lot. I, th- I think Sheffield United, what you've got is Callum O'Hare and Gus Harmer, two of the top, real top individuals in the uh, in the championship. Uh, Harrison Burry is another one I, I really like. Um, so it's difficult to compare the 11s. I, I would probably just about side with Leeds, but the real difference between these sides, um, as I've alluded to, is probably the squad depth. Jack, for you, I know you're getting excited about Norwich this season. We will speak about them later, but in terms of promotion rivals, right, we're talking about Leeds and Sheffield United as teams that are going to be right up there for you. Are you seeing that as we progress through the season? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, if we're talking about the the, the two games that Norwich have had against these two, both ended in 1-1 draws, but they were very different games. It felt as if Norwich should have beat beaten Sheffield United and were probably unlucky not to do so. And against Leeds, it, it always felt like if we could have finished with a point there, it would have been a, a good result. I think, you know, looking both at, at Norwich internally and also the other sides away from the, the people that we think will finish in the top six, I am including Leeds and Sheffield United in that kind of grouping. Gab mentioned it there, but it comes down to squad depth. And often you'll get into the, into matches 65th, 70th minute, starting to you know teams are starting to fade and you know Sheffield United with that parachute payment Leeds United you know we know all about them they have the ability to pick a bit of quality off the bench that most other sides don't and that's what I've really noticed with those two um, teams and I think we'll see a lot particularly under Daniel Farker and that Leeds side has a lot of late goals particularly in the kind of second half of the season and um yeah, that's such a strong asset to have in, in this division and both sides have that in, in bundles. It's very early, obviously, Jack, but what's your gut saying right now in terms of Leeds and Sheffield United? Will they be playing Premier League football next season? Both. I'm, I'm not sure about both. I think one certainly will be. Um, and what, you know, to, to, to pin something to the mast at this stage would be... Would be um, <laughs> would be bold to do so. Um, I'd say out of the out of the two, Leeds have a better chance. I know plenty of shrewd judges put them up in terms of the outright picks at the start of this season. And despite a couple of wobbles, early doors, I mean, Leeds never make things easy for themselves. You still probably back them to have enough over this stage. And, you know, having watched the championship over the last, you know, 15, 20 seasons, you will occasionally get the odd side who were just far better than the rest. And we had that last season with Ipswich and Southampton and Leicester. Um, I don't think we've necessarily got that this season. It feels a lot more open at the top. I'm certainly not saying, you know, Sheffield United leads all good sides, but there isn't a standout. And I think that makes it a really interesting dynamic this season. Um, You throw those two in, you throw a couple of others in, suddenly you've got a really competitive division. I don't think we necessarily had that in terms of any one of those top 10 have a chance of promotion this this season and that feels really exciting definitely exciting like wide open as you say last season was such an anomaly with those teams at the top yeah we've got a, a tricky question for you there. Oh, no. which club is bigger Leeds United or Sheffield United oh Leeds, oh, Leeds United yeah definitely well have you I think I've, I've just realized I've sort of come on wearing Sheffield United colors here I, I you know, I've been to both of these grounds as as an away fan, and um, they they never um, they never give you a very warm welcome. I'll I'll give you that. But we spoke on here last season, Simon, ahead of that um, that playoff semi final game, and you often hear people talking about that atmosphere is crackling, and and I'd never quite understood it. Like I've been in atmospheres before that you know just incredibly loud and um and and joyous but i'd never quite experienced what i experienced at ellen road last year you couldn't hear yourself think it was was like nothing i'd ever experienced you know it's not the biggest stadium in terms of a capacity but the noise that that place generates particularly when it's going well and you know it's such a cliche but having a 12th man they really do have a 12th man when when things are going well and the pressure that it brings as well. I mean, you know, Daniel Farker, we talk about there being pressure at Norwich City because the expectation and it being a one club county is nothing like the same as going to Leeds United. And he's had a serious job on his hands here, just trying to manage that. I I think it's, you know, Leeds are a massive club. So are Sheffield United, but I think Leeds are by far and away bigger. Just to add to to that, Ace, uh, I think... Probably the mark of how big a club is is how disliked they are. Because I think if you look at Leeds, you know, as clubs in Rotherham 
uh, clubs in Yorkshire, sorry, um, like Barnsley, like Rotherham, like Doncaster, they all hate Leeds United. They probably don't really hate Sheffield United that much. And I also feel like with those sort of category of clubs, Sheffield Wednesday, they're probably more unpopular than Sheffield United. It always seems to be like Sheffield United are seen as kind of a bit more neighbourly and the rivalry is a bit friendlier, whereas with Sheffield Wednesday, there's a bit more of an edge to it. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think Leeds United, so this isn't an insult, like Sheffield United are, are a grand club. They've got a great history and, and all the rest of it and full respect to them um, for that. You know, they create a great atmosphere at Browning Lane as well. Um, but I think that for, Le- for me, Leeds United are one of the top 10 biggest clubs in the country if we're talking in terms of uh, prestige. So I think that's the difference, really. Absolutely. Um, John, let's talk a bit about Fark before we move on here, because he's taken the Leeds job. Obviously, promotion was the main aim last season. He did incredibly well, got 90 plus points yet again in the championship, but couldn't win the playoffs. It feels like this season, like there's an awful lot of pressure on Leeds and him especially. Are you still impressed with him, still in love with him? How are you feeling about Daniel Fark right now? I think the... the I've got a slightly different opinion on, on Daniel Fark. I mean, he goes down in terms of, you know, legendary status at Norwich City for the work that he did. He was a complete unknown when he came into the club. Very similar, actually, times in kind of 2018 to what Norwich are going through now with Johannes Hofthorpe in terms of we needed a new identity, we needed a rebuild. And Daniel Farker, alongside Stuart Webber, who was the sporting director at that time, kind of figureheaded that. And we saw a real change in recruitment with a lot of Germans coming into the club. And it was all very new and fresh. And it, it was incredible. It was an incredible time at Norris City. But he doesn't come without his flaws. And I think it's okay to say that. Like, there's no manager in the championship without their flaws. And for me, um, Norwich held on to, to Daniel Farker for, for a little bit too long, particularly when we were in the Premier League. And you're almost not allowed to say that. You know, you can't criticise managers if they've done well in the past. And I just think that's wrong. And I think way too many head coaches stay on for too long and almost like sour the taste a little bit because, you know, it's better to go out when, when you're on top. And I think we held on to, to Daniel for a little bit too long. It's going to be fascinating to see. The big problem that Daniel had at Norwich um, was, you know, stubbornness in game tactics. And I think we, we're seeing that a lot with, with Leeds fans now. The criticism is substitutions come too late. He's, he's far too reactive in a sense in terms of trying to tra- change things rather than being proactive. And I think we've seen that a couple of times. Maybe certain um, stubbornness with certain players, players that should be dropped. Um, that are maybe staying in the starting 11 too too long. I think in terms of managing pressure, he'll be fine with that. He's never seemed like someone who lets that get to him. And in terms of having the perfect man for a club, Daniel Farker feels like he is that for Leeds United. He can take a fan base on a journey. He can, um, you know, in terms of what Leeds had with Bielsa, it was more than the football. And I feel like Farker can provide that in terms of you know putting a philosophy in and 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 creating a real culture around the club it does feel like it has to be this season for him I think it will be um but it's going to be fascinating and, and already you know what we 10 games into the season or whatever we are there's been ups and downs um at uh at Leeds and I think there's going to be a lot more of them it's certainly not going to be easy um Farker will, uh, will will get some good things out of his side, but there's certainly fragilities to his management. And um, yeah, I think we'll start to see some of those this season as well. Absolutely. Let's wrap up our little uh, lead Sheffield United preview with a score prediction from you both, I think, because it's a massive game. Sheffield United unbeaten, Leeds still favourites for the title. Gab, what do you reckon the score is going to be in this one? I think it could be 2-0 Leeds. Okay. Okay, Jack? I mean, I've come on wearing red and white, so I need to be slightly more kind. I, th- I think this will be a draw, actually. I think two very different sides. I think, um, you know, Wilder and, and, and Fark have some history. I'm going 2-2. Brilliant stuff. And we'll look at our second in-focus game this week, which is a bit of a derby, isn't it? Luton versus Watford. Um, feels like, at this moment in time, a, a must-win game for Rob Edwards. We've already touched upon Luton's kind of poor start to the season. It's not gone as we expected, Gab. How do you feel going into this one? Is it a must-win game for Rob Edwards? Um, I think it's certainly a game where he could, where winning it is significant in terms of um, winning, a, lifting the mood around Luton, and um, and and maybe get you know, gaining a bit of a bit of support back. It's the kind of game that does carry that bit of extra significance. Um, yeah, I I do feel for Rob Edwards because I think Luton have missed 
um, that clinical edge this season. They've spurned a lot of chances, but I, I think he's also looks like a man that's kind of searching desperately for solutions and hasn't quite been able to find them. And um, and I think if he can find them in this game, then then the timing would work. But at the same time, I think on the on the flip side of that, I also feel like Watford are a team that have kind of um, that have been clinical, but have a nest. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't look at Watford and think they've performed miles better than Luton. I just feel like they've taken their chances, whereas Luton haven't necessarily. And maybe the the gap between these sides is probably a bit narrower than probably the table suggests. Fair enough. But, and for you, Jack, what do you think's gone wrong in terms of for Luton the, the, this season so far? Gab says they haven't really taken their chances. They've been a bit wasteful. But you think there's something more than that going on? I don't know. I, I think with, as I kind of alluded to earlier, I think way too much is always read into that Premier League form. And, and, and Luton had that story, didn't they? If they were up against it. And often that first season in the Premier League, you will, you know, buck some trends. And although they didn't survive, they gave it a really good go. I think my question would, would almost be like, what are the expectations for Luton this season? I think, I think Gab's right in terms of there's not a, 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 as much of a gap between these two sides as maybe the table suggests. I think Luton have been unfortunate in a few of their games. They've got some some really good players in that side and, and, and you would think that um, they will rally together and they've got a good manager there and things will turn out okay. And actually, like, is a mid-table finish that bad a thing for Luton? You know, they, were, um, they weren't expected to go up when they did and they far out, uh, you know, out, out achieved what they were expected to do in the Premier League. So I think people's expectations often get, slightly distorted when you've had that taste of, of Premier League football and just that automatic expectation that it's going to happen again and it just doesn't happen like that. And uh, and also, you have to look into the amount of effort and work and mental capacity it takes to compete in the Premier League week in, week out, and then just hope that you can bounce straight back at the first time of asking. Um, that just doesn't... Um, it just doesn't work like that. So I think Luton will be okay. I think they'll think they'll rally. I, I, I can't see them picking up top six um, this season. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't say anything's necessarily gone wrong. I think we're just going through the kind of the ebbs and flows of football at the moment. Fair enough. And Gab, in terms of expectations, that's an interesting one, really. In, in terms of what Jack says, does it have to be this season for Luton? It feels like maybe it's a longer term project, maybe. But also... They've got a lot of players there who were in the Premier League and competing quite well. If you look at Carl Morris and Adebayo, who got 10 goals apiece, I think, last season. Yeah, I mean, you, you've got those two strikers who are among the top goal scorers in the Championship last time around. You've got Alfie Doughty, who's been talked about as uh, an England contender for that sort of left wing back, um, left back spot. Um, you've got, you're spending a, a lot of, um, a big fee, a big seven figure fee on someone like Mark McGuinness, who they brought into defence. So I definitely think, you know, Marvellous Nakamba, for instance, is a top player in, in Championship level. They've got some good players, and I think they would expect to be performing better than than they have been. Um, I think they've looked a little bit imbalanced, a little bit wide open. I think at individual moments, um, it's felt like there's been a bit of chaos, or you know, when they concede one chance, it seems to be easy to carve them open again. And um, so, I think there is a bit of a fragility about Luton at the moment. And the big question is whether um, Rob Edwards can be the man to sort of. Um, Toughen that fr- fragility and, uh, and and iron things out. And I think at the moment uh, he's under a lot of pressure. Um, I think they've that they're creating enough chances, but they just need to sort of rejig the balance a little bit. And um, I expect them to pick up their form. I think they'll finish higher than uh, I think they'll you know um, rise, grow, and um, climb the table. From but how much higher they'll climb is is the big question because I think uh, a top ten finish is probably the minimum expectation for a club that's just become out of the Premier League. And for Watford, I think, Jack, they have to be one of the surprise packages of the season so far. I know there was kind of a lot of worry, Tom Cleverley very inexperienced, but it's going brilliantly so far, isn't it? No, oh, absolutely, yeah. And the, and, the, and the mood amongst the fan base seems really positive as well, and that can carry you a long way. I, you, you know, Gab knows far more about Watford than I do, but I was... Um, I, w- I was concerned for them going into this season. I was listening to all these podcasts and reading articles, and I don't think I saw anyone really having them outside of at least the bottom five. And I think most people had them down for, for, for relegation. So it was, con- you know, that was a real concern. I must say, having watched them at, um, at, at Carrow Road, they were wide, wide open. And, and I think that was a, a, a real concern. You can't, 
you can't compete in the championship on a on a consistent basis when you're um when you're that open um but they've got some they have got some quality in there and um yeah, cleverly is an interesting, you know, spectacle in terms of a manager, isn't he? I don't think anyone quite knows what we, you know, what we're in in store for with um with him. But yeah, that's certainly a surprise package. It will be interesting to see if if they can um maintain that over the course of a season. You often have a few outliers, you know, this early on in the in the campaign, and actually, it feels like this season's been going on for far longer than it has because of the amount of international breaks that we've had. Um, we're still fresh and uh, yeah, I think we'll start to see both of these clubs start to revert back to to type um, soon. But yeah, it's been a marvellous start for, for Watford for sure. Agree with that, Gab? Uh, are Watford going to revert back to type or, or can they maintain this? I don't think they can maintain this. I, I don't see them finishing in the top six. Um, I've been um, miles more impressed with sides like Norwich City or, or even Middlesbrough in terms of that uh, playoff equation or even Sheffield Wednesday. I think what you're looking for at this stage is what teams can do at their best as opposed to, I think you can work out consistency in time. But for, for me, Nor- um, Watford, um, they've been clinical, um, but I think as performances like the one at Carrow Road probably showed, there is a vulnerability. I think they can be a bit passive defensively. I look at somebody like Musa Sissoko and the way he sort of jogs without the ball and it's you know, not really to my taste. And I do kind of worry about the influence on on other players um, in terms of against the ball. I feel like there's a vulnerability about Watford and um, I, I do feel like I, I want to see more from them. And it seems strange for a team that's performing, you know, in the top six after nine games and, and sort of defying expectations. But I'm not sure I necessarily see this continuing, whereas I think Luton are 21st and I actually think they're going to finish quite a bit higher. So for me, I, I actually still think Luton are going to finish above Watford this season, personally. Does that mean you think they're going to win this game as well, Gab? Yeah, I probably would go with Luton, yeah. I think, uh, I think, I think Luton, yeah. Brilliant stuff. Right, let's move on to the next part of the show where we're going to focus on two teams here and talk about them in depth. And of course, one of them has to be Norwich City, given that we've got Jack on with us. Um, Johannes Hofthorpe, we're absolutely flying under under him. Did I see you and Chris on your on your podcast donning some some promotion caps the other day, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Um, yes, it did. Uh, it was actually Gab that uh, convinced me to, to, to wear. I'm, I'm slightly more reserved than my co-host Chris, and he was. Uh, I think he was ready to go after about four games this season. I was just telling him to hold off, hold off, hold off. Anyway, he he, he was thought, he was ready to go on the car to Oxford, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I saw Gab, you know, and, and and I love following Gab, and there's some other really, you know good kind of um, championship gurus that I, I, I look to when I'm looking for a kind of informed, slightly more um, balanced reason. And, and I must say, like, everyone seems to be mightily impressed with, with not only Norris City, but Johannes Hoftorp. I mean, it's been, um, it's been great fun. Like, I think it all boils down to that. We've had a couple of seasons of, despite David Wagner getting us into the playoffs, it was quite a tough watch. And, and actually, that was probably the minimum expectation considering the squad that we had. Um, Dean Smith in the Premier League and into the Championship was was really tough, and then we had COVID seasons of Premier League football and the kind of um, the 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 kind of fall off of Daniel Farker at Norwich City. So about it, I'm not going to come here and sort of you know plead that we've had a really tough time. It's it's been fine, um, but in terms of like it being fun, we've not had that, and we've certainly got that back now. Whether we'll get promoted or not, it's, I think it's still far too early to say. I don't think we've got enough depth in the squad, but. Um, you know, we, we've beaten Hull 4-0, we've beaten Watford 4-1. There will be plenty more games like that because when this side gets gets going and, and, and gets moving forward, they are really, really tough to stop. And um, and that excites me hugely. Jack, uh, do you feel like there's a vision that Norwich City fans can buy into at the moment with the way, the, the style of football that we're seeing at Carrow Road? Massively. And I think, I think vision's a good word and, you know, in this modern day of football, I speak about it with Farker at Leeds and, and it, you know, there's other managers that it's more than just the football. And you have to have that because, you know, the football teams will lose multiple games in a season. And, and, um, and when that's happening, you need to, 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 to hold on to something and buy into something else. And not only at Yanis Hofdorp, but Ben Knapp has come in as our new sporting director who was previously at Arsenal and his recruitment so far has been spot on the, not only the players trading coming in, but outgoings. We picked up 
big money for players, um, which has been really nice to see that we've not just rolled over. There is a vision. There is a feel-good factor. There's a philosophy on and off the pitch. If you watch Johannes Hoff Torp speak, he's remarkably um, approachable, but also there's a you, you certainly wouldn't want to mess with him. Um, the, the way in which he handled Jonathan Rowe, who refused to play on opening day, was incredibly impressive. You know, this is a young man, but his CV is incredible. Managed in the Europa League, is now managing at the top level of the Championship. The, the fear for Norwich fans now, is, and it's crazy to say, is will we be able to keep hold of him? Like that is the fear now, and um, time will time will tell for that. But there's um, there's certainly a philosophy back at Carrow Road, and um, you need that. You need that at any club. I saw a really good clip actually of him in the dressing room with Borja Signs after the uh, after the the win, and and it was Borja Signs asking for a week off or, or something, and he just kind of nipped that in the bud quickly. I was quite impressed with that. I think we should talk about Borja Signs as well because I think many neutrals would have seen Norwich sell Gabby Saar and John Rowe in summer and think, right, I know they've got Signs and Sargent, but it's probably going to be a bit of a drop off. You've lost two key players there, but he has been the best player in the championship so far. Quite, quite simply, right? Yeah, I think so in terms of the numbers he's putting up. Um, and it could have been a lot more. I think Johannes um, described him as being far too emotional in front of goal. It was after Norwich lost to Swansea 1-0 away from home and Science missed probably two or three chances that he should have finished, a couple of one-on-ones. Um, and ever since that point, he, he seems to have just found something in his game. And there are definitely similarities between him and, and Emi Buendia, who, who we had and... I don't know if you can kind of think back to those early days of Buendia at Norwich, but there were a few stupid sendings off. Um, there was kind of discipline issues in terms of on the pitch. He was an emotional player and it's a it's a double-edged sword. That's what makes um, Buendia and, and with science such exciting players, but it can mean um, that certain things go wrong. And he just seems to have found the maturity the last kind of few weeks. He has grown into the system. I think he's flourished now that um, Johnny Rowe's not here and he's you know, got regular game time. He's almost playing as a as a centre forward at times and Sargent comes out wide. You see a couple of the goals in recent weeks. Sargent's providing the the assists for science. But this is a, yeah, this is a really exciting player. We always knew he was exciting, but the numbers didn't quite stack it up. And when you're trying to have a chat with someone that doesn't um, watch science and you're going, oh, he's been brilliant this season. And, and, and people go, well, he had like four assists and two goals in a season. Now that's not impressive. It's the other way this season. His the, the goals are there, the assists are there. Um, he is very exciting with the ball at his feet. And again, another one, when you're a, a club like Norwich City, um, these types of players will get poached eventually. So we've just got to enjoy them while we can. But yeah, definitely um, definitely one to keep an eye on. I, I think if there's Premier League um, fans watching this, you will see Borja Science on the, on the team sheet of a Premier League or a La Liga team very soon. There's, there's no doubt about that. I love, yeah, I love the uh, Bullhurst banger, but um, <laughs> but I, I will say, where well, for me, the one is Josh Sargent, because as much as Borja signs us, um, found some real productivity this season, um, for me, what I re- what I always look for in a striker, people talk about uh, goals, and of course, that's great. But for me, it's when a striker can uh, play well without scoring, when they can really extract the best out of their teammates and make the rest of the players around them better and the team better. And for me, to me, Josh Sargent does that because he's just got this incredible work ethic. Uh, he can drop in and and link up play, but he can also stretch the fences going in behind. How many centre forwards do you see that can can do both so well? Um, and he seems to be able to create for other players um, with that selfless work ethic. So for me, Josh Sargent, best striker in the championship. I'm glad you said that, Gal, because I think, for, for a lot of last season, he had that bad injury, so his kind of numbers were hampered slightly. But I was, I've was i been saying for a while now that, that Sargent's the best striker in the division. And look, I get carried away. I like to get excited about my football team. But I, I think that sometimes kind of devalidates my my opinions. But um, with Sargent, I, did, I genuinely believe he is the best striker in this division. We're lucky to have him in the championship for another season. And we saw the drop-off in, in Norwich last season when Sargent was injured for, I think it was four months after an injury against Huddersfield. We just completely fell off, and it's it's it, one of course it's the goals that he brings, but as you say, Gab, it's the it's the ability to bring others in, um, you know, and, and support them. We had it last season with Sarah and Rowe. We've got it this season with with Science. Um, 
he's, he's completely selfless. He should have scored more goals this season. But I think when you look at the, the, the big chances that Norwich have created, we've scored a lot. We've also missed a lot. You know, there's more gears to go through here. So it's it's very exciting and he fits perfectly into that um, Johannes Hofthorpe way of playing. It's um, You've got a lot of players in this side that are very suited to the to the playing style. And that's, um, yeah, I, the only way is up, I think, for, for Norwich at the moment. You'll be able to speak more of the similarities than I will, Jack. But it feels like, you know, when you sold James Madison for 20 odd million, and then the rest of the team kind of united and, and seemed to get better as a result and people stepped up. It, it feels like that's kind of happening again, even though you've sold key players who on paper are better than the ones you've got. It feels very similar to that kind of era of Norwich for me. Yeah, I think I think you're right, Simon. I, I think you're right. You know, you, you, you're able to work on a system a little bit more when you're not as reliant on a, on a single player. Um, and it also gives opportunity for players that, you know, otherwise wouldn't have, have got in. You look at the likes of... Ante Sienatz, who was brought in for fairly big money, and although hasn't, I don't, well, he hasn't scored yet, has, has been impressive. And I, I'm describing him as having some Josh Sargent syndrome at the moment. He's he's not a winger, but he's playing on the wing because he's that good. And they're just trying to fit him in. Oscar Schwartau, who's 18 years old, he wouldn't have had a chance if Gabby Sauer was still here. And it's incredibly impressive for for his age. So there comes a time where you have to sell your best players, particularly when you're in a position like Norwich that aren't at the top of that food chain one for financial responsibility. And I think Norwich have got it really bang on in the last couple of seasons with cashing in at the right time. We saw it with Andrew Omabamadeli. He's barely played since he left Norwich, but we cashed in well. Max Aarons, um, Johnny Rowe, I know he's, he's going on to do brilliant things in France, but got good money for him. And Adam Eder. It's about getting everything you can out of that player Letting them go at the right time, it, it, it sets a, a precedent and a model to your other young players that there is a roadmap away from Norwich and that you can go on and flourish. And Norwich reap the rewards as well. So I think in terms of um, sales, and you can go right the way back to Madison and even you know sales predating that, um, that has been something that we've been good at. And, um, and yeah, you're right. The system kind of flourishes because of that as well. Talk to me about Callum Doyle, because he's one that's really stood out to me in this uh, Torop system, because he seems to be playing like a, a left centre back, a left back, a winger, and a, and a midfielder all in one. He's the true universal footballer, isn't he? He is a remarkable talent. And the reason I hadn't mentioned him is because it feels slightly illegal that he's still playing in the championship. I mean, this is a man who is quite clearly too good for the division. It's as simple as that. I watched him on opening day play left back against Oxford and Norwich were really poor that day. But I just looked at him and thought he's probably a centre-back. He was He's quite a bulky player, um, shifted into centre-back, played brilliantly there. Then we had an injury, moved him back to left back. As you say, Gab, he's picked up a couple of assists. He, he's got this ability to kind of drift into like left wing. He scored a couple of times. Um, he is the complete footballer and at this level um, is just far too good. It, it, it's as simple as that. You know, he, he can play right the way across the defence. I, I, I suspect if you dropped him into midfield, he'd be absolutely fine there. He, you can tell he's had a really good education. He can pass the ball. He's comfortable with it at his feet. He brings other players in. The other thing that I really noticed with Callum Doyle on opening day, he had a, a, a centre-back pairing of um, Grant Hanley and Shane Duffy next to him, two very experienced wily defenders and he absolutely destroyed them in verbally the entire 90 minutes you are you know he was screaming at his captain for the entire 90 and I just looked at him and thought you have to be good to get away with that and you know he's he's very well respected in the dressing room and the players love him but I just looked at that and thought if, he, if you're digging out experienced players like that you've got to back it up and um and he does he is a, a remarkable young player I just don't get it with Callum Doyle because he's a player who was on loan at Coventry when we got to the playoff final, then went on loan to Leicester and won the league. And so it feels like the next move, obviously, is a, a Premier League loan if he can't get in the Man City team. And then for him to go to Norwich, I was like, what? why has he gone there? He's, With all respect to Norwich City, that it seems like he's gone backwards a, a step there when he should be getting a Premier League move. But he, he's going to play for England. Yeah, I, I looked at the, you know, he's he played over 100 senior appearances and at his age is remarkable. And you're right, you look at the um, at the kind of journey and, you know, every club he's been at, he's succeeded. I know he had that injury at Leicester, but Norwich, um, 
were after him for a very long while and they were really nervy that they were going to miss out on him and eventually got it through over the summer. And I think it, if he stays fit, it will be certainly be the, the signing of the summer. Um, as you say, you know, it feels like the next step is the Premier League, but fair play. I mean, there's how many examples have you got when you, you've got a similar player to Callum Doyle and you're like, they're, they're ready for the Premier League and then they move somewhere and, 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 and things kind of stop their progression stop. So um, you, you're right. He, he should be playing Premier League football, but to, to know exactly when to take that step, I think is really difficult. That's a fair point. Right. Let's move on to our other club in focus. Um, actually, Jack, let's, before we move on from Norwich, where do they finish this season? How are you feeling now? I think they finish top six. I really do. And I think it comes back to, um, I think it comes back to the, the kind of competition in the championships this season. I, I, I don't necessarily want to say it feels weaker because I think that's the wrong word. I, I just say it feels like a, a more level playing field. Um, Leeds, we've drawn with Sheffield United, we've drawn with actually our fixture list over the first sort of nine games has been really difficult. Um, I think we've only played something like one of the bottom, you know, bottom half side. So, um, defensively, we look good. We're scoring goals. All depends on injuries. I know that uh, Josh, um, sorry, Jose Cordoba, um, Marcelino Nunes is going to be out for a little while. So that raises question marks. It's a thin squad. Um, so it's it's all going to be injury dependent. But at the moment, uh, you know, I can't see any reason why this side finishes outside of the top six. Cab, you on board? I am on board. Yeah. Um, I think... Um... For me, um, I, I like West Brom, I like Leeds, um, sticking to Sunderland winning the league, obviously. And so I, I think I think Norwich uh, are very much um, uh, going to be a secure playoff side and possibly a team that can challenge for the automatics. But um, uh, yeah, they're, they're having a great season and, uh, and real progress being made there. Brilliant stuff. Uh, let's look towards the bottom of the table now. We're going to talk about Portsmouth for a bit. Um, Gab, are you slightly disappointed with Portsmouth? And I say that because we know they had a really tough fixture list at the start of the season. But they've played Stoke away, got beaten 6-1. Then they've failed to beat Oxford at home. They still haven't won a game in the championship. Are you, are you a bit underwhelmed? I, th- I think the Stoke game was, uh, Stoke performance was an aberration. Um, no, um, n- no denying that. I, I would say that apart from the Stoke game, I think they've actually been competitive in all their games. And I don't think it's the case that they're not creating chances. Um, I think that they've had difficulties um, possibly at both ends just to make sure that they tick off the points. But I think that once they do get that first win, it wouldn't surprise me if they're able to put a few results together and uh, and maybe pull clear. Um, but um, at the moment, that's a long way off, of course. And um, I, but I, I don't think they're they're a million miles off. I mean, if you look at other than the soap game, they've conceded what fourteen games in fourteen goals in eight games. They definitely have some um, some defensive issues to address. Um, but I don't think they're. I don't look at Portsmouth and think they're a million miles away. Um, but um, I think it's a learning curve, isn't it, for John Massinho? Because he was um, sort of 18 months ago, two years ago, he was still a, a, on the books a player at Oxford United. Um, so to then become a, a, a championship manager so quickly after that, after um, uh, the, this incredible achievement of winning the League One title, um, I think he's built a team that's got a great spirit and a great resilience about it. So um, I don't think Portsmouth will go down without a fight. I don't think they're too far off. I do think they're going to turn a corner, um, but it's been a tough start for them. Yeah, no question about that. And how much time, Jack, do you think a manager like Mussinio gets at Portsmouth? It's been a tough start, but they were a League One side. We know how difficult the step up is. Do you think he's got a bit of credit in the bank still, or is it is it beginning to run out? No, I think there's credit in the bank. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned there, actually, like how big a step up it is, because I think when you see... Clubs like Ipswich who who come up from it um, from League One and then just like you know run away with you, you know in the Championship and are so good. People forget that there is still a a massive jump. So I think you have to you know you have to dial yourself back in to reality. And and and, and you look at um you know you say there are no wins in in nine. You just assume that they're going to be cut away at the bottom of the table. And they're not actually bottom. So it it shows that um there is still hope for for these kinds of, of sides. The, the the concern is, and, and, and Gab said there, like the performances haven't actually been that bad, barring that um, barring that Stoke um, performance, and, and they've obviously got a new head coach. So there's certain anomalies there. 
there comes a time and it's really difficult because you are just looking for performances at this stage. There comes a time when you just have to convert those into results. And the longer that goes on, the more pressure that, uh, you know, are piled on to, um, to each and every performance. And that's when it gets difficult when you're then reverting away from what's worked before you're reverting away from the playing style that you've embedded over a successful league one campaign. That's when it starts to get difficult and I'm sure that, you know, the board at, um, at Portsmouth have already got candidates lined up if this doesn't turn in the, in, in the next few games. You would hope that there's credit in the bank, but there does come a point where you have to be brutal and you have to look at the season as a whole and go, we need to make change now before it's too late. How long that is, and, and it's always dangerous to say in this, in this modern day, is, it, it's incredibly difficult to kind of work out. But I think, you know, there's still so much time and there's some there's some, some poor teams in um in this division so i think there's still hope for, for for portsmouth fans as of yet just something you touched upon there Mike, i'll ask you about this well while, while we touched on it there's um stoke new manager narciss Palach. what was he like at norwich and were you surprised to see him go and get that job no, I don't think I was a su- surprise. I'm a very highly rated coach. Um, didn't know a whole lot about him when he came into the club, but kind of rose through the, the ranks pretty quickly at Norwich City. And I think the the mood around the place was always that he was going to go and become his own man, um, ma- you know, manage his own, his, his own side. And also for Johannes as well, you know, he it was important for him to bring in his own um, his own staff. Surprised that he's got, you know, a, a, a I, I, I will call Stoke a big club in the championship. I'm surprised he's, he's leapt in at that level straight away. I, I, I didn't expect that to happen. But again, a, a, another really intriguing um, chapter to, to look at over the coming seasons. Um, I, I would say there's big expectations, Stoke, to, to, to do good things. Or maybe they are trying to rebuild and, and, and do things a different way. But um, yeah, clearly a very, again, young manager, highly rated, um, very intelligent and, uh, and will do things differently, that's for sure. Sorry, Gab. Go on. What were you going to say on Pompey? Yeah, I, I think just just quickly they, they've got they've had a lot of injuries so far this season. So, for instance, Connor Shaughnessy was a key man for them at the back uh, last season, and he's started the season injured. So they've had uh, a number of players absent as well. So, um, I think Owen Moxon's been absent as well. So, it's those sorts of things that uh, that haven't helped uh, John Mazzinio. But on to Stoke, I, I look at that squad, and I think that they've got so much potential in there. When you think. Eric Bocat, I think they were surprised they were able to get hold of in the summer based on how good they thought he was um, in France. Victor Hansen was one of the best goalkeepers in the championship last season. They've got Walter Berger. Tom Cannon scored four against Pompey. Uh, I think they've got a lot of potential in that squad and hopefully um, they've now got a coach who can really um, bring the best out of them because, I, I, yeah, I do see potential there. Absolutely. And it's a big game this weekend, actually. It's um, QPR versus Portsmouth, which is obviously two of the, the relegation candidates right now going head to head. feels like that could have quite big consequences, Gab. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think that the challenge that QPR have had is, um, so when Marty Fuentes came in, obviously it didn't work for them under Ainsworth because the style was too defensive. Sif Wentos tried to rip that up and go for a more uh, possession-based approach. And initially there was a slight improvement, but the, the results really came when they, they sort of became a bit more dynamic and were a bit more sort of transitions led. And that's kind of what got them the bulk of their points in staying up comfortably in the end of the championship last season. This season, Sif Wentos has tried to go more in the direction of possession-based, but he's had players like um, Cook at the back, like uh, Jimmy Dunn, um, like Sam Field in midfield, players who probably don't quite fit that style of football. Uh, they've also got a 28-year-old um, CEO in Christian Nuri, who's very new to the role as well. I think they've been so data-led and so sort of focused on scouring Europe in their recruitment that they've they've missed a little bit of a balance as well to their team. Um, and um, and that's where they've become a little bit vulnerable um, in uh, in losing 2-0 at uh, QPR last weekend. Um, so, yeah, there's a few problems for QPR to address, and I'm sure they'll be keen to... Um, get dig out a few points between now and January, and um, I think they might need to uh, to strengthen in the next transfer window. Excellent stuff. Let's round off this little segment by talking about Cardiff's next manager and the odds for that, because Omar Iza remains in charge as we speak. But the top four in the, in the running: Slaven Bilic, Claude Makélélé, uh, Omar Iza, and Ryan Lowe. The top four, Jack. 
let's get your reaction to some of their names in in the mix for the Cardiff job. These um these next manager markets are so bad. I was half expecting you to kind of say like Alan Kerbishley six to one or something. He always seems to <laughs> Neil oh, Warnock. He's coming back. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> you know the thing, and and you know we've had our fair share of these markets over the last sort of five years or so. It's often a name that you've never heard of that comes in and 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 is the most um the most influential. I do I do worry about Cardiff, and I, I have worried about them for the last few seasons really um you, you kind of look at that i'm just i've got the table up here and i'm looking at that like from 14th down and you go through like plymouth sheffield wednesday Bristol City, stoke one good size and i think you know good clubs and also like i could probably tell you the identity and the way in which they're trying to go about things of each of those clubs you asked me like what card if are trying to do i couldn't tell you and maybe that's just my ignorance but for the last few seasons, it feels as if their their um, trajectory and their path has been slightly muddled, and I am really kind of um, concerned about them at, at, at this stage. That managerial shortlist does not fill me with confidence either. Um, I don't know if Gab kind of knows of any outliers of, on that list, but you know, if I'm looking at that as a Cardiff fan, I'm uh, I'm not feeling great about life. Well, one thing that I like that Amar Ritza has done is um, he's been, um, there's been a bit more meritocracy with selection. So one problem Cardiff had towards the end of Errol Bullock's reign was that Aaron Ramsey kept starting in the tip because he was this sort of big main player with his sort of profile, when actually Ruben Colwell's probably the future of Cardiff and, and Wales um, in terms of in a similar similar position. Um, and what um, Omar Rietzer has done is actually bring Ruben Colwell into the 11. And I do think there's been an improvement in terms of Cardiff looking a bit more dynamic, looking a bit more creative. They played very well at, um, at Bristol City. I think that might have been Rietzer's first game in charge as caretaker. And um, and you could see that there was an, an improvement there. And, um, and so, yeah, I feel like Cardiff, um, maybe there's something to be said for giving Reek to this sort of interim period and seeing if he can lift the mood and bring the club together and, and actually let that situation breathe a little bit because it seems like the players are playing for him and it seems like they're they're creating more chances than perhaps they were under Bullet and um, and sometimes if you've got a caretaker manager that's doing well actually just you know give that situation some some room to breathe. I'll offer an alternative view and just say I think it would be absolutely brilliant if Claude Makalele was on the sidelines in the championship. Why not? Why not? I think that would be absolutely excellent. <laughs> right, we did Gab's corner of concern last week. And I know that, Gab, we haven't had many games to focus on. And also, this feels like it was a bit personal. And I've, I'm booting you off because you picked Coventry as your team to be concerned about last week. Jack, I don't know if you gave us a little preview there of, of your team because you're our special guest you're doing our corner of concern. Is it Cardiff that you're worried about or is there another team? No, I am worried about Cardiff. But I, I mean, that just feels like a cough out, doesn't it? Just going for whoever's bottom in the championship at the time of recording. I, I think it's always, as I mentioned earlier, these international breaks have just ruined the flow of the start of the season. I'd be really wary about writing anyone off at this stage in the season. So much can change. Um, you've got transfer windows still to come. You've got so many games. You've got certain teams that will go on long kind of cut runs and um, that will... Um, it, kind of influence things. But I must say, having looked at the bottom half of this championship table, as I said earlier, at the top end, it feels very competitive. At the bottom end, it feels uber competitive as well. And it doesn't feel like you you have a side that are just going to be awful this year. And often there is one of those. But I do look at Cardiff and and I'm concerned, not not overly because I'm concerned about them per se, but it's, it's more the teams around them. I think Pompey will have an uptick in form. QPR will find something. Luton are outliers. I think they'll certainly improve. Coventry shouldn't be in 20th place. So I think if you're looking at a side that um, might be tasting some League One football next season, it probably is Cardiff, unfortunately. Gab, would you agree with that? I'm worried about Preston North End. Um, I think they've shown some defensive resolve under Paul Hackingbottom, but um, there's still a question mark as to whether they're going to score enough goals. So I, I still have a um, a bit of a worry about them. I think so. I think for me, Cardiff, Portsmouth, QPR, Preston, they're the teams that I'm probably most worried about. I think Luton and Coventry will climb the table. I think Millwall will stay about where they are. Um, I think Stoke have some potential. I think Sheffield Wednesday are going to fish a lot higher. I still think um, Plymouth Argyle and and Derby County could be drawn into it. And um, it's too early in the season. To, you know, Oxford have got themselves a great points tally, but they're still only five points ab- above the drop. 
Um, they, they've got a lot of points at home early doors, um, but I'm not necessarily sure that they're going to be able to keep uh, that consistency going. They've had a lot of players that have made um, a big step up. I think they've recruited really well, to be, fa- to be fair to them. Um, so I can only credit um, Oxford United, um, but I still think that they could be drawn into it. So for me, um, I see the bottom six, including Cardiff, Portsmouth, QPR, Preston, and then two from um, Plymouth Argyle, Derby and, uh, and Oxford. I don't think that's a, a corner of concern. I think that's a, a small lounge of concern. Got. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got a big room. <laughs> I think Preston might um, do better for goals if their their striker didn't keep biting people. But yeah, it doesn't you know, help, doesn't it? Yeah, when your striker doesn't doesn't particularly help. Um, yeah. Just had a message come in from the producer saying that Big Sam's thirty three to one for the Cardiff job. That would sort them out, wouldn't it? <laughs> from England to Cardiff. Um, Gab, we'll finish the episode as usual with your championship treble for Saturday's action in the second tier. So let's see the teams and fixtures where you think we can get a winner. Yeah, I think Middlesbrough might beat uh, Bristol City this weekend. I think Middlesbrough have been uh, one uh, a really creative side so far this season. Uh, they did lose 2-1 at Watford just before the international break. Um, but in other games, um, they've, looked, uh, they've looked very dominant. They've been able to win at West Brom this season. And they've been pretty good at the Riverside as well. So um, I'm feeling pretty um, pretty bullish about Middlesbrough this weekend. Um, I also think Millwall at the Den um, are, um, it's like is a different proposition going to the Den. Millwall at home, I don't know if you agree with this, Jack, as a, as a championship fan. It, you know, if, you, if someone says to you, we've got Millwall at home um, this weekend, it's like, should win that whereas if someone says we're going to go to the den that always sounds that sounds like a different proposition doesn't it 100 percent, 100 yeah that is a there are certain grounds in the championship that you just do not want to go to um the den certainly top of that list <laughs> yeah so so millwall i think are going to beat derby this weekend i think they're going to have very good home form um this season and i'm also backing you for wednesday to beat burnley because i think wednesday are actually a better coach team than Burnley. I think Burnley have been able to get by so far on individual quality, but I actually see them dropping possibly out of the top six. And I think Sheffield Wednesday are going to um, find some form pretty quickly. Brilliant stuff. We'll get that priced up on Betfred for you um, and we'll share that out to our followers. I think that is all we've got covered for this week. Jack, anything else you want to add about Norwich? Any last final closing statement you want to add before we finish? No, nice to come on here and, and, and smile about football. A real pleasure to, to speak to you guys um, as always. And, and and I think for for those that are maybe listening to this pod that don't watch championship football on a on a regular basis, like this season's a really good season to get stuck in. It feels wide open. There's some good players, exciting talents, and um, yeah, plenty of competitive football. So so get stuck into it. I think you're bang on as well with the bottom of the table potentially being close to this season and and the top as well. I think. And it's, it's all open. It's all wide open. So plenty of great action to jump into. We'll be back next week, me and Gab. Thanks very much for watching on the Sportsman Untitled. Make sure you like and subscribe. Put the notification bell on as well to see our latest uploads on YouTube. And if you don't want to see our faces, you can, of course, listen to the episodes on Spotify. So make sure you, you watch us on there. But that is it. Thanks very much, Jack. Thanks, Gab, as usual. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>